Hey folks, in this interview, a little something special. We're going to be talking with a photographer out of Santa Fe, New Mexico about fine art pet photography. This is Twit. Hey folks, welcome back to This Week in Photo. Um, this this in interview is going to be pretty interesting because I'm I've, I've had a couple of photographers on before that talk about sort of pet photography, but never from that sort of high-end fine art level of it. You know, it's more of portraiture, which is great and all that, but not fine art level portraiture and black and white and really pushing it to its level, to, the, to a different level. So Jesse Frieden is here to sort of talk about his process in creating fine art photography with pets and what his methodology is for doing that, what the process is, why he chooses to shoot primarily or process primarily in black and white, all sorts of things. So Jesse, welcome to the show, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's good to have you on. You are, I caught you in the middle of a move, so you're, you're doing all kinds of stuff over there. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time to do this. I'm excited yeah, to chat with you. Yeah, this is, this is going to be good. So let's, let's start off with um, just a little bit of background on what who Jesse is as a photographer and what led you to this particular genre of photography mm -hmm. yeah you know um I've always been a portrait photographer portraiture is really what um drew me to the medium um I like to say that when I was little I would steal my parents pull a red camera and go out in the yard and photograph my neighbor um and I think that sort of that interest in studying people through a camera lens started at that age. And um, so, you know, all throughout um, college, I was really just, I was doing portraiture and I started with instant cameras and it became a real obsession. I was kind of documenting not just my life, but the relationships in my world. And then, you know, fast forward um, years later when I was in San Francisco and I was uh, apprenticing at a family, a high-end family portraiture studio um, I w was thinking about working with families as well and kind of following in the footsteps of my mentors, but I really didn't have much interest in families. You know, it didn't, I didn't, I, I don't have an amazing rapport with children. It's just not something that, um, I'm fascinated by, but what I was doing for many years was working with dogs professionally. And, um, I was so interested in the relationship that we have with our animals and what it means about us. And so you know, when I was apprenticing at the studio and thinking about starting my own business, one of my mentors mentioned that I should photograph dogs. Um, at the time, it sounded really silly. I, you know, this was almost 15 years ago. And um, the dog photography at the time was really cheesy and kind of colorful and very wide angle and very kind of commercial. Um, so long story short, you know, I, I did a session with a friend and her dog. I actually have that photo here in the studio. Um, I took out my Hasselblad, you know, this is what I was shooting back in the day, and I, I had this real aha moment, and I realized that um, photographing dogs, for me at least, is really just a way to study people. It's a vehicle for studying the human condition, and um, that just kind of got things started for me, and ever since then, I've been doing this every day. And what do you see, you know, that's an interesting kind of tangent on that. So the 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 way that, that portrait photographers approach a session, I would imagine, is a little bit different than the way you ap approach a session because you have two clients. You have the owner and then the actual subject themselves, the dog, right? So mm -hmm. th is, that, is that a benefit or a, or a negative towards the whole interaction? It's a, it's a good point. I mean, you know, I do feel like the way that I approach my work is very much in the vein of a portrait photographer. That's how I run my business. That's how I run my sessions. And I really, you know, yes, dogs are clearly an integral part of my work. Um, but I'm doing it more in the human portraiture approach. However, just like you said, you know, when a photographer is going out and photographing a family, um, doing a wedding, doing photographing kids, it's very photographer and, you know, human subject. Mm -hmm. There's not much in between. What I get is this creatures, these dogs mostly, that really are kind of this um, medium to understand my client. So, you know, I've been doing, I've been working with dogs for 20 years now and watching our, how we react with the animals being really just kind of like a mirror about how, who we are. Um, so it's a really interesting way to understand who someone is and understand what 
not just what their relationship is like, not, it's definitely not just about the dog. It's about, you know, it's really about studying unconditional love and studying relationships and dogs get to be kind of the vehicle that I, I sort of look at everything with. Do you, do you, do you find that, that the whole, I don't know if it's a myth or just a, you know, if it's true or not, that owners tend to look like their, their pet <laughs> or <laughs> vice <defi> versa. <laughs> it's definitely true. I mean, really, wow. I think it's true. It's, uh, I don't know why. Uh, I think we look like our animals and we definitely talk like an or act like our animals. You know, if you think about it, you know, it's like if you have an animal that spends every waking moment with you, you guys are apt to rub off on each other and their energy is going to mimic yours and vice versa. Um, so, you know, my interest in, in dogs, obviously I'm interested in dogs because they're wonderful animals and all these things, but really it's about, it's not just about what dogs give us, but it's about what we are able to give dogs. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a much more, um, deep, uh, sort of study than just sort of what, what's on the surface. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a symbiotic kind of relationship. Yeah. You know, I'm interested about, you know, we, I, when I introduced you, we sort of talked about, and, and during our pre-interview, we talked a little bit about the, the distinction between fine art and, you know, or do, what is fine art, you know, and what the definition is of it is. And we know, you know, both of us realize it's subjective, but mm -hmm. I want to get, you know, from your perspective, what, what is, when you say I'm creating fine art versus art, what, where does your brain go? It's a good question. Um, I'm sorry, can you still hear me? I had to tuck that back in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. So um, it's actually a good question. I, I've been doing these videos um, on social media now that since we're in quarantine, and it's a way for me to kind of stay relevant and share my deepest thoughts on my work. And today I did a video actually about um, kind of on this topic. You know, I think for me what fine art means, and it is a little bit of an annoying term. I think some people can use it misuse it just like anything. Um, but for me, it simply means intention. It means being skilled at your craft and imbuing your work with intention and using, you know, the knowing your materials in and out, knowing why you're doing this work. Fine art for me, I mean, I wish there was a better word. Maybe it's just like intentional art, but it seems like the binary opposite of, of snapshots and, you know, any photographer in any, any niche, um, <clears throat> knows that there's a billion photographers out there that are just doing snapshots and kind of, you know, work that doesn't have any meaning, um, mm -hmm. which is fine because some people just want something quick and easy and there's something for everyone. But I do think that fine art or intentional art is when you really have a story to tell and you really know what you're doing and why you're doing it and you have, you know, a deep understanding of the ins and outs of your medium. I think that that's really what it means to me. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And it means something different to other people, right? And it's, sure. it's one of those sort of nebulous kind of terms, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it depends on what your perspective is. Um, but it, it, which is fun. That's what's great about photography and art, right? That you can't put right. it in the box. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, into how that dovetails into pet photography and how, how, you know, the, you're able to, the shots that, that are on the website that I'm going to show are, amazing right they're clearly fine art they're beautiful shots um clearly you have a style you know kind of high key black and white you know i can it comes through loud and clear and i can see why people would you be sought after uh, how do you like during during the sort of conceptualizing phase of putting this thing together take me through how that works like i get on the phone i call you up and i'm like you know what i want to i want to get a professional you know, Jesse level shot done of my work. What, what next, what happens at that? that point? Yeah. It, you know, for me, it's, it's all about storytelling. I mean, that's really all I care about. That's what keeps me interested. And that I think is why people come to my studio. Again, there's just like any other niche. There's so many people in this niche of dog photography and we all have our own style, et cetera. But I think people end up coming to me because they want someone to tell their story. And they don't just want a snapshot. So when someone calls me on the phone or sends me an inquiry, the first step is, well, we have, we have to have either an in-person meeting here or we do it over on, on the phone if they're outside of Santa Fe. Um, and it's just, tell me your story. I just, we just have a conversation. I need to build trust with them, number one. I need to understand who they are and like what this animal means to them so that I can 
I can understand, like you said, how am I going to approach this for them? It's different for every single client. Um, it's not just show up, take a few snapshots, keep a dog in a leash and squeak some toys, which is a fine way of going about things. You know, I keep dogs off leash. I let dogs be themselves. I go to my clients' homes. But the way that we get started is we, the clients have to have a consultation with me. Um, and so that I can understand what's meaningful. Is their dog old? Has it just been diagnosed with um, cancer or something? Is it, you know, that's something that brings people in a lot. So I want to understand, I want them to get honest with me and real and, and vulnerable, a little bit at least, so that I can really absorb that and understand whose creature is. So when I show up to create the work, I'm in the right kind of emotional, psychological space. And that's how you create good work. It's, I'm not doing this for myself. I mean, secretly, yes, I am studying people and dogs <laughs> through, through my work. But yeah. um, if my clients are going to be moved to tears, if they're going to be moved to invest financially, then I have to really understand their story. And that's how it starts for me. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So, so talk a little bit about how you how you niche down into. Well, we talked we talked a little bit about your how you why you went into this genre of of photographing pets and dogs. But you know, there's a whole lot of pets out there that you could be photographing. Why specifically dogs? Why not dogs and cats and birds mm-hmm. and alligators and ferrets and all that stuff? <laughs> I'm I am afraid of birds, so I don't like birds. Um, so that's why I don't like to photograph birds. <laughs> okay. I have, you know. I have photographed over this, it's been about 13 years at least doing this consistently. Um, I probably photographed like 10 cats <laughs> over all this time. But, you know, that old adage, like photograph what you know and yeah. what you understand. That's where, the, that's where the strength and the depth is. So that's what I do. I photographed horses. Um, I'm afraid of horses, although I'm intrigued by them. And I photo, so I, it's not my specialty, you know, but I photograph clients that have dogs and horses. I've photographed elephants, I've photographed, uh, I mean, tons of things. However, my bread and butter is dogs because I've, you know, literally it's been probably 20 years that I've worked with dogs professionally in, in some manner. And um, that that's really the root of my sort of interest in this world is that, you know, when I was little, we didn't grow up with dogs, but I had this photo somewhere of um, one of our family friends had a, this old golden retriever um, and there's a picture of me somewhere like at age like three laying on the floor with this dog, you know, and, and for me, I deeply have always understood that bond that I'm trying to recreate and show for my clients that there's this sort of unspeakable connection we have with dogs that I know very well firsthand so that when clients come to me and tell me their stories, I'm not, I'm not pretending by saying, Oh, I understand. It's like, I deeply understand. And that I think is, you know, why I can, create good work so uh, that is really cool so so from a business perspective how well, how big is the market you know clearly you've been doing it for over 20 years right so it's sustainable but for people that are looking in their local area you know to maybe throw their their hat in the ring or try this out is there is there revenue to be made it's a good question i get that i mean i can't tell you how often i get that question um yeah. At dinner parties, from clients, from strangers. Yeah. I mean, still after so many years of doing this and sort of carving out my space in this world, people yeah. still say to me, oh, is this your full-time job? It, it's a little rude, but the answer is yes. Um, yeah. There are lots of people in this space. When I started almost 15 years ago, there weren't as many. There was a couple of really uh, wonderful people that were doing this work, but there's very few. So, um, you know, when I started, I... Um, I saw that there was a space. No one was doing what I was doing. No one was doing kind of high-end black and white work. And I would, and it made sense to me because that was really what I wanted to do anyway. So I sort of took up that space. However, there's so many, you know, quote-unquote pet photographers out there. Um, and I do um, a lot of teaching and, and mentoring and business coaching one-on-one. And I tell my students the same thing. You know, there is always space to do this in your own way. If you're copying someone, there's lots of people that, just again, in any niche, in the wedding world, the portrait world, everyone always copies everybody else. It's kind of this like blob of the same style. If you're trying to copy someone else and you don't have a particular style that is bulletproof and strong and confident, you won't succeed because no one's going to, you won't stand out. However, if you can create your own strong style and it tells a deep story and you are authentic about your 
in your marketing and you're doing things confidently, you will totally succeed. I mean, even now in this crazy, terrible time, and even in the last recession, people are always spending money on their animals, especially their dogs, because, you know, these dogs are, their lives are short. People that have money want to sort of spoil their dogs, and by spoiling their dogs, they're really kind of loving themselves. So there, there is always a market for it, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting. So well, let's talk, you, you, you brought up style and developing a personal style and, and niching down, you know. What, what, is the, uh, the, what was the mindset behind you deciding to move into black and white and making, you're putting your stamp on black and white versus you know, full on beautiful technicolor, you know, <laughs> going, going monochromatic. Why, why did you yeah. make that call? You know, I mean, again, I think it's, um, I think the best artists are ones that it's just, they do what they know. They do what makes sense to them. They're not making work because someone else told them, well, you should shoot in color or you should shoot in black and white, or you should use this thing or whatever. You know, I'm not a gearhead. Um, this is just what I love to do. I've always loved to shoot in black and white. Um, before I was doing this specifically, I was, you know, shooting my Hasselblad, processing my own film, printing in the darkroom, doing every single thing from start to finish. And um, I just, you know, color, for me personally, I'm not a master in color. I do feel like I have a very strong grip on black and white, um, and I can do it super well. And it just... It, you know, this sounds a little like woo, but this is just how my mind works. My mind works really well with tonality. I love the zone system. You know, I love being able to <clears throat> put so many little bits, points of contact in the process to, mm -hmm. you know, this was in the beginning, but I was choosing my film. I was choosing my chemistry, my temperatures, all that stuff. Um, so that's part of it. But I think also um, for me, black and white removes distraction. When you are shooting in black and white, all you have to work with is emotion and story and tonality and texture and composition. That's all you have. You know, sometimes I see a color image and the color is beautiful. Like this is a super cool sunset or, you know, this, um, the color on this dress is really beautiful. But what I'm looking at, what I'm attracted to is the color. I'm not attracted to actually the full picture. So, mm. um, I think that's why I shoot in black and white. You know, some people think it's a challenge or I personally think color is a challenge. It gives me a headache. I, I love it, but I'm like, why are, what's color casting and uh, temperature? I, I can't deal with it. Um, so, um, but black and white, it's classic too. I think also for me from the very beginning, this is how I was raised in the studio um, where I was an intern and, and uh, apprentice. Um, it was also black and white and you know, I created my business to be a high-end business. So this is just sort of how I've decided to do my work. And so the black and white does lend itself to that, I think, as well. And the last thing I'll just say is, you know, a good amount of my clients are collectors, are collectors of some sort. And when I, when I can overlap those communities of people that love their dogs and also collect and love and appreciate black and white photography, that's, you know, that's, that's a win-win. It's a win-win, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I was going to ask you that. That was a perfect segue because I was wondering from a from a marketing, a sales and marketing standpoint, does the positioning of your work or using black and white as sort of your primary look, does that ratchet up the perceived value of it over a color print? You know, just because people look at black and white and it just feels... You know, it feels Tiffany's versus the jewelry counter at Walmart, right? <laughs> yes, that's a very good analogy. You know, that was never my intention. I was never, I never was intending to sort of use black and white as a crutch, you know, as a like, oh, I'm going to elevate my work, so I'm going to do it in black and white. However, I do think that is sort of what people read into it. So people like to say the work looks timeless, you know, or um, <clears throat> fine art. And I'm glad that that's the case because that is how I've marketed myself. And again, you know, I didn't choose to do sort of a higher end version of this kind of photography just out of a whim. This is just how I want to make work. You know, I'm yeah. very attached to the materials. I've always been very attached to the process. I always want to, you know, I just, this is a very authentic way of running a business for me. Um, and thankfully, you know, there was, there is room, there has been room for me at least to do this at a high end level and to have clients that seek it out. Um, but, but still, like you said, people are surprised that I can run a business doing this full time. And, um, 
that I can sell work at the price that I sell and all this stuff. And you know what? It, I couldn't have told you 15 years ago that I would have done this and it would have worked. But I, I do think, and I t- teach this to students too, like look at the market that you want to work in, look at the sort of world, whether it's kids or dogs or whatever it is, and see what is not being done, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you don't want to repeat someone else. You want to make work. You want to fill a gap that isn't being filled and do it incredibly well. And if you can do those things, you're going to be successful, you know? Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, find find the niche and, and fill it, but make sure that yeah. that niche that you find is something that you're skilled at, right? And don't right. just find a hole and try to fit yourself into it. Right. So. It has to be. Yeah. I mean, I think it. I think the la- one of the sort of keys to success because people always want to have like, well, sometimes people just want to know an easy answer, and I I wish there was. I wish there was an easy answer. I wish there was like, okay, take these three steps, and you're going to be good to go. However, that's not the case. But I do think an incredibly important sort of recipe or part of the recipe is being authentic and being real. You know, I sometimes have students that are, they kind of like dogs, but they're, they don't have, it's not like you have to be obsessed with your dog, but they don't have a deep understanding. They don't have a deep appreciation. The people that I think succeed are very skilled and you can always work on your skill by practicing, you know, they have something to say. And that's something that again, takes practice and they're being honest. And I think if you do all that stuff, especially now, yeah, you'll be good. You'll be yeah, good to go. But yeah, if you if you don't have that that deep understanding of the psycho the, the psychology of dogs and the behavioral you know ticks and all this stuff of, of yeah. that it takes to to overcome that stuff in order to be let the artist in you come out and get the shot. How do they get that level? Should they go to like a, a local ASPCA and volunteer, or what's the best way to to get up to speed on the psyche of the animals that they're going to be photographing? It's a great question, and I I mean I'm a super nerd, so I love I love like deeply understanding these kinds of things. However, you know, like if you were to if I was to go photograph kids, I could do it. And if it was like the only job I could never have is to photograph children, what I would do would be 100% study, you know, intellectual, academic articles about children and their relationship mm-hmm. with their parents and the psychology of them and how to, not how to act around them, but like what, why are kids the way they are, you know, et cetera. So for people that are thinking about coming into this world of sort of animal photography, um, you, in order to understand that relationship, yeah, totally volunteer at your local shelter. They always need people. Um, it gives you a free education about Mm -hmm. how to deal with different kinds of dogs and how to deal with, you know, what behavior things and just literally how animals act. I think a thing that a good photographer knows how to do, um, is sort of pre-visualize things before they happen. Right. Yeah, is to understand yeah. what happens before it's going to happen. And that can, that can be weddings. That can be, I don't know, headshots, whatever it is. But if you, um, it's very decisive moment. You know, if you know what's going to happen before it happens, that me- means a, you're going to be able to create without having to think it's just kind of inherent, but also it means that you really have studied the subject. So, um, yeah, go volunteer at your SBCA, read up a bunch of articles, about the dog human relationship. I mean, I used to study and I still do um, tons and tons of books on traditional dog paintings from centuries ago and the history of dogs and art. And I think, you know, you have to kind of become an art historian in your, in your subject matter if you want to sort of do a very solid job. Yeah. I think that that's, that's sage advice because the, the, I would imagine the way not to approach this is to say, ah, well, it's a picture of a dog. I'm just going to go take a snapshot and, you know, print it. It'll be good. I'll throw some filters on it. Oh, good. Right. right. You know, or, or put yourself in a situation and have it not be ideal. Right. Like something like you, you, the dog is not happy and you're, you know, and something goes wrong. Have you ever had one of those situations where, mm-hmm. you know, the, just the dog was not happy and came after you or was in- otherwise misbehaving? I mean, in, in, in all these years of working with dogs, which has been many years before even doing this work, you know, I really have not had many terrible, I had, you know, that's awesome. Terrible that's things cool. happen. However, there was a, in just about a year ago, I had my very first session where I got bit and, um, oh, it was, wow. you know, your very first 
with, yeah. the, with this particular animal? No, just in all these years, I've really never been bit or had something. I mean, yeah, dogs misbehave. Like one time a dog ran away during a session. So um, <laughs> actually that happened twice. Um, but, you know, whatever. Like it was two sessions where there was kids involved and the kids ran down the street and there was a really cool moment of photographing them coming down after having captured the dog. Whatever. But I did get bit once. And you know what? That's just That's just sort of the thing that, you know, that's the danger of working with animals or, you know. Mm-hmm. You have to kind of be ready to um, just deal with that. And it's very rare. However, that's, again, why I do think it's so important. If you're going to do this well, you're going to be around people. You have to know, I, I think it's so important to understand the psychology of people and the psychology of people and their animals. And also know that what, what to do if a dog runs away or a dog uh, is growling at you. You have, you know, you're going to face those things because you're a stranger coming into a dog's house. And... Um, you just need to really know how to, again, sort of understand what's going to happen before it happens. And yeah, you're, you're coming into his his or her territory, right? And you have to act accordingly, right? Yeah, yeah. that's it, it's a whole it's a whole interesting world. Do most of these shoots take place at the at the the client's residence, or do you have a studio where you bring them in and you shoot them there? Like, how does that happen? Yeah, so I never photograph in the studio. I mean, once in a while, I will um, I do commercial work very rarely just upon request so i'll shoot in a studio then but all my work happens in my clients homes for a couple of reasons one i want to see where the dogs are most comfortable and where the people are most comfortable i mean if the people are if they're at ease the dogs will be at ease and then my job is very easy so i also want to photograph i mean i'm looking at this wall right here there's a print you know that has the interior of my client's home and it's subtle detail that, you know, maybe someone walking by wouldn't notice. But when you can sort of integrate those details into your images, it, it's it's familiar to the client. And that feels comforting, number one. Um, and I just love sort of incorporating those little daily details. We'll photograph in a backyard. Um, we'll go to the beach. You know, I was in California for many years. and um, So the beach is fun. However, my job is going to be easier when the dogs are just kind of contained not like you yeah. know trapped but you know if we go to, i don't ever go to a dog park really because there's tons of dogs there and the dogs are going to be wanting to play with their friends or they're going to be anxious all normal things but um you know i keep things very calm i don't use any treats or toys the dogs don't need to be in a leash it's just very zen and calm and you know i talk like at this level the entire session um and that lets the dogs trust in me and have their energy come down. And, and so that, that all works well when we're in a place that they're comfortable without distractions. That's great. And all, and all that comes from experience. It sounds like, you know, having sure. done it many, many times before. So yeah. then, then what, from a hardware standpoint, you know, if you're, you're out and about at the beach or at the client's home, and these are all different you know, situations that require, I would imagine, different gear, you know, different mm-hmm. lenses, et cetera. Get, what's, a, what's, what's your loadout to go to one of these assignments? What does that look like? I mean, you might not like my answer. My loadout is one lens and one body. And I keep an extra body. I love body. that answer. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I keep an extra body like in the car or in my back. Um, so I started in the very beginning, all these years ago, with the Hasselblad 500C, which is fully manual, and my, my meter and my film in all my pockets and all that stuff. Um, and I loved that, you know, I loved everything about that. It was very slow and very intentional. However, I, the only reason I really changed to digital, which was probably just like four years ago or something very well, yeah. recently, um, was because I couldn't get my hands on film anymore and chemistry and paper. And it just was too hard. So I was very hesitant to switch over to digital, but so now I just use the, the Canon 5D Mark III and a 50 millimeter 1.2 lens. So the lens is, you know, awesome. And, um, I mean, that's it, you know, I never shoot wide. I don't like shooting wide. Um, I never want to distort my subject. Mm-hmm. Uh, I use the 50 millimeter lens when I was shooting the Hasselblad. I also, I used the 80 millimeter, which for medium format is the same. It's basically yeah. a 50 millimeter. Quote my, normal my, lens, right? Correct. That's what your eye sees, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I, the physicality of photography has always been part of why I love it. So like my body is the zoom, you know, when I'm out at the beach and I want to get, I want to pull back and I want to see a wide angle. I just walk myself back. 
And when I want to come up and really be intimate, I physically move myself and my 50 millimeter lens in. And um, <clears throat> that's just how I like to shoot, you know. Um, You're so. zooming, zoom with your feet, right? Zoom with your, zoom feet. With your feet, you know. Yeah. Again, I think, I don't know. Honestly, I don't think I've ever known anyone else who does that. Everyone else has like got 20 million lenses and all this gear and um that's great. Yeah, See, that's got that's got to be a relief because you know they we I think all of us I think it goes goes with the you know the the field of you know having all this digital sort of high tech magic wizardry to choose from and then the the optical precision of these lenses and the smooth feel and then the new body with all this crazy stuff on it that you can do it just yeah. it you know it it inspires that gear acquisition syndrome that that we have and then pretty soon you end up with a bunch of lenses and you get that analysis paralysis like which lens should i take i don't know should Correct. i use the zoom lens or you know what i'll just bring all of them you know <laughs> so, right and then now and you're, then you're wearing yourself down whereas someone like you was like i got up, yeah. yeah i got a body i got a 51 what did you say the 17 or 12 12 yeah i got a 51 2 and and now you know that lens better than you would know if you had five lenses you would never be intimate with those lenses for the most Correct. part you're intimate with that lens you know when that dog's over there and you're here you know what that's going to look like without having to sort of look and chimp and do all that stuff right yeah yeah and, and you know i think also i mean as I, as i was saying this i don't think it's ever actually dawned on me <laughs> uh, but i t i uh, i have this wall of cameras over here in my studio i um, collect polaroid cameras because that's really what started me many, many, many years ago. And it, it's similar to using a Polaroid. It's how I used a Polaroid back in the day. There was one lens. You don't have zooms. And you yeah. physically walk yourself in and out. And um, for me, again, I think that's part of me not being a super gearhead or a techie person. I, I want to be creating. It's like it's very physical to me. And my tool, my camera, you know, I always tell students, you have to know that tool in and out. You should not be thinking about, you should not be blowing your camera and fussing with your aperture or whatever it is. It should be, it should be up, down, up, down, smooth. You know, it should be an extension of your body an extension of your eye really. So, um, but again, you know, whatever, as long as you know what tools you're using, that's what you should be using. However, I do think you're right. People get into, all these different lenses and all these things and changing them up and you know you're missing moments you're you're too you're too concerned with your the technicality in your gear and when you do that you know in the times that i've done that when i used to have to change film you know <laughs> physically i would i would miss moments um mm -hmm. so again i think the simplicity of your gear and the simplicity of the product allows for like this real presence in the moment i think that's what adds depth to the work less less is more right All less, is, less more, is more yeah well, let's look, wrap it up and, and talk a little bit about uh, the the end of the process the post processing part of it uh and and the the presentation to the client how does that work like, what are what are you editing these photos in and then when they're edited what where do they go to in order mm -hmm. to share them with the client yeah, so I do. I only use Photoshop <laughs> again. Like I'm very old school. Um, I'm like, what is Lightroom? Too many things. Um, so I use Photoshop, and um, I sort of have this proprietary way of converting now my color digital images to black and white, so that it has sort of like a split tone, which is kind of what I would do in the darkroom. Um, and the black and white now really feels like my old darkroom room prints, and I, I love that. So I do all my editing. Um, in Photoshop, and I have never owned, you know, a digital uh, printer because it's like too high tech for me, and I don't know what to do with it. So I always have, you know, here in Santa Fe, I've got this wonderful printer who um, he's a fine art printer for lots of artists, and he just keeps my paper on hand that I love. I use this really beautiful fiber paper, and he just does the output for me. So it doesn't do any editing. No one touches any of my stuff. I'm like obsessively in control of my work. Yeah, um, yeah. But so. So my printer does the digital output, and then the work comes back here. Um, I do all my own matting. Um, so I, I cut my mats, everything's signed and archival and put together. And then my clients will either purchase the prints matted and signed in an archival sleeve, or they will purchase the work framed. And they have that choice. Um, so, and, yeah. And again, like, I mean, I'm really neurotically in control of the end result. Now, 
some people, most of my clients, to be honest, if they're going to have invest in me doing the framing, they'll use my recommended frame, which you can see behind me. It's just a black stain. Yeah. It's really simple. Um, some clients have a really particular look of a kind of cool molding they want. And so I just refer them to my a local framer in whatever city they're in. Like, you know, in San Francisco, I've got a great frame shop that, that um, I work with. So that's kind of the end result. The end result is a series of prints. You know, usually clients are investing in three to six really beautiful pieces, usually like one or two larger pieces and maybe one or two smaller pieces. Um, the work is meant to go on the wall. You know, I don't, we're not selling CDs or do they do CDs anymore? Jump drives or whatever it is of digital files. Um, it's art. It's going to go on the wall. That they're going to look at every day and experience every day. And, um, and that's how it works. And, you know, the way that I, I, I do in-person sales. Um, so and I, for, for long distance clients, it's kind of like a hybrid in-person virtual thing, but I'm very, very involved in the sales process. And I, my clients know that and they trust me. We build this trust. I show them exactly what the options are for the different sizes and I help them in, uh, curate a collection of prints. And in the end, of that experience, you know, they're investing a good amount of money and um, they trust me to make it really beautiful. They trust that the work's going to last for forever because it's archival and all these things. And, um, you know, it, it's a, I spend a lot of time with my clients. And, and how, uh, how does that curation process work? Or is it, is it a, are you using a gallery service? Or are you just sending them, you know, a, a link with some images in there? Yep. Like what, what is that? How I, does it work? Yeah, I don't ever send any links. So clients never get to look at the work without me present. Oh, okay. Oh, so, nice. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's basically for, in the studio, I have a projector and a screen and they would sit down here and, um, after the, after our session, a few weeks after, and I would select 20 images. I don't usually show more than 20. Um, and I sit here and I show them the work and I help them narrow down the group to their favorites. And once they've done that, and we talk about sizing and then we kind of create a sale that way. Um, and then, you know, that's a foundation and there's sort of a hybrid version for long distance clients. But, um, you know, that's great. That that yeah. that like I said before, Tiffany's versus you know the the big box store jewelry counter. It it, had, yeah. it sounds like everything you've described so far from the shooting process and the contact with the client, the the working with the animal, all the way through to the final touch and the final delivery, and you being like you say obsessive about every little detail. That sounds high end, right? That doesn't sound yeah. I'm, like I'm price shopping and. You know, from a from a group of commoditized photographers, it sounds like right. you, you know they have to work to get you to accept their job, right? Which is yeah, which is awesome. It's true, and you know, it's not for everyone. You know, thankfully, there's lots of people in this space. You know, um, at this point, I think by the way that I've done my marketing for all these years consistently, my website, you know, all these sort of touch points before they actually pick up the phone, people really get a sense that you know what this is going to be kind of high end. It's not going to be the cheapest guy on the block, whatever. However, you know, when people actually get past those little hurdles to actually finally call me 90% of the time, they're qualified, they're ready, they're excited to work with me. They want to have an experience with an artist as well. And that's really fun for me too. I get, I mean, I'm, I continue friendships with my clients for many, many, many years. And that's really fun. Um, but again, it's not for everyone, but I, I don't, I can't please everybody, you know? So, um, yeah. there, there is certainly the screening process goes both ways. I want clients to screen me and I want to screen them, but so we know it's going to be a good fit. I love that. I love that. That's great. I, it's really refreshing chatting with you. You know, one of the, I talk, I've talked to hundreds of photographers and I can say very few of them have that level of aesthetic and that high touch, high customer service artisanship that, you know, that, that you're talking about here, usually you know, in no disrespect to the other photographers, but usually it's more of a, okay, I shoot the photographer. There's a proof gallery, you know, I send them the link, they make a gallery of selects. I retouch those selects and, you know, and they pay me and I go to the next client, you know, or some, something around that vein. I've never heard right. the, I've never, I don't think I've ever heard the sentence. Um, my clients never view the images without me present. Right. Which is which speaks volumes. Right. Because yeah. you you can explain every little nuance and what you were thinking when you made that shot versus leaving, yeah. leaving it to them to make guesses about what what the image is supposed to be. Right. It, it, that's that's exactly right. I mean, a it's, it's really twofold. One, I love I mean, I'm, I really spend a lot of time with my clients. It's not like, OK, you book me on my calendar thing on the website and then I'll show up and then whatever. It's 
we have to have the consultation. Um, you know, we have to do the session and then I, then the sales. And then, so there's like, it's like many hours of work. It just extends for, you know, it can be like a month or two before they get the work. Um, so I want to be there when they see the work because I want to see their reactions and I want to sort of see what they love and what they don't love. I want to sort of I, I honestly, we're just talking about art. I'm like this, you know, I love this piece because of X, Y, and Z. That's what makes my job fun is getting to talk about the work in sort of an in-depth way and not just say, oh, your dog is cute. I mean, yes, dogs are cute. We can't deny that. That's great. Um, but also from a sales point, again, my clients are investing a lot of money. So from a sales point, being there in that process sort of helps me guide clients where I want them to go and also helps them feel supported they're investing a lot of money i want them to feel really good about knowing that i'm going to do the best work that i can for them and that it, it's a i'm giving them permission to make that investment so you know all, all those reasons make it necessary to be part of the, the process i love that see that see it's the key phrases in there jesse it's like i'm giving them permission to make the investment right that is <laughs> those That's are powerful <laughs> words i love and, that <laughs> and it's true and you know i mean you know, there have been a few times in my life where I've invested a lot of money in some a piece of art. Like I, my dog passed away a while ago, and I I knew exactly who I would hire to paint his portrait. It's so beautiful, oh my gosh! But it was very expensive, and so you know, and I, I, years ago got a big tattoo that was like way super expensive. But I know what it's like to commission an artist and say, "Here's my idea. Tell my story for me. Have the freedom." Like I do your, what you're going to do. And the work is going to be worth the thousands of dollars. So, you know, I think that is also a way of building trust is I know what my client's feeling, everything they're feeling, I've already been there. And so I can truly say, I understand and let me help you. And, you know. I, love that. I love that. So if, if, uh, if people want to, you know, contact you either to, you know, commission you to do uh, photographs of their pets, or if other photographers want to learn from you, what are the, the different ways that you have set up? Yeah, so um, to uh, schedule a photography session, everything's on my website, which is um, jessiefreedom.com. That website is mostly about my private commissions, so there's information about how I work, and you can see a bunch of photos, and you can contact me to set up a call so we can chat about photographing your dog. Um, again, I work in Santa Fe and I work a lot in San Francisco and I travel around. Um, I also, the other kind of half of my business is the mentoring and business coaching for photographers. Most of those photographers that I work with or that work with me, um, are in the sort of animal pet space, but you know, I've taught artists of any medium how to market themselves. So, um, so the information about uh, mentoring and um, being a, st a student is also on the website under my projects tab and, um, and uh, sorry, under my uh, mentoring tab, mm -hmm. there's information about working together. And um, yeah, you know, it's, I love working with photographers and I love teaching people how to build websites and really just learn how to turn their art into a business that's successful, but also authentic, you know, um, it's a fun challenge. So. Yeah. And it sounds like turn it into a, a business that's reflective of the quality of service that you want to offer, right? Because you know, yes, you can exactly. throw up a quick website and, you know, get a logo built on 99 designs or whatever, right. but, but to put up something that's, that's truly a reflection of you and the quality that you want to give to the client, that's something completely different, I think. So. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I, I mean, I love, I really love teaching. I was mentored by wonderful photographers and I love getting to kind of pay that forward. And I love seeing my students build up their confidence, of course, learn how to do the nuts and bolts of running a business um, and make work that's authentic to them and then see them succeed. You know, I mean, there's nothing better than that. It's really fulfilling for me. Love it. Love it. All right. Well, Jesse, thanks for taking the time today. It's a busy Monday. You know, we got it done. Um, you know, uh, I, I enjoyed chatting with you and congratulations on, again on the, the business that you've built and the quality that's sort of that golden thread that sounds like, or well, let's call it a silver thread, right? <laughs> that's, running, that's running through everything that you're doing. I think that's, that's amazing. And, and it's also really inspiring in terms of brand building and positioning. So very good. Great. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. It's, it's really fun to talk about that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, thanks for the, thanks for the time. You're welcome. All right. Well, you have a great week and stay safe out there. Yeah, you too. All right. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Take care.
This is Twitter.